Welcome to a new lecture about the role of conformal diagrams in general relativity. Today, we are going to discuss the Penrose diagram of the reisner nostrom solution. As you probably know, the reisner nostrum solution represents the gravitational field created by a point particle in general relativity. The line element is given by the following expression. And well, I'm just going to grip to write also the expression of the electromagnetic two form, right? And well, Q is the charge parameter. Okay. Right. Well. One has to distinguish uh, different cases according to the roots of this uh, expression, okay? So let me just, well, we need to find the roots of this expression and the number of roots will give us a classification of the reisner nostrum solution, okay? I have to solve the second degree equation. I'm going to write down the solutions for you. And from this expression, you see that uh, the number of real roots will depend on the positivity of this quantity. And in this sense, we distinguish three possibilities. forgot to write here the roots okay and then the case in which we don't have real roots okay right so <coughs> for each of these cases the solution have different global properties. And we will notice that because we will get different Penrose diagrams, okay? So we need to study each of these cases separately, right? Okay. So, mm, okay, let's start with uh, this case. Right. Well, obviously, we have this relation, and uh, yeah, we need to write the metric in a convenient form. We just have to factorize uh, the polynomial we have uh, solved. Okay. Then we can write the 
Reisner Nostrum metric in this form, right? Well, uh, well, I forgot to mention at the beginning that uh, the Reisner Nostrum like element is already written in a coordinate system which is adapted to the spherical uh, to the spherical symmetry. So we can follow the procedure which was explained in previous lecture, right? And that's what we are going to do in this case. So we only have to take this uh, Laurentian part and do some transformations on it. So I'm just write separately the Laurentian part. And we're going to transform this into something which is conformally explicitly conformally flat. And here, well, it's easy to guess the transformation which we need to use, okay? So we have to use the following transformation. Sorry, there's a square missing here. Uh, well maybe I can just write it down below because otherwise I don't have enough space. Okay, so uh, right. Okay. Okay, and so if we do this transformation, it's uh, we get a, an expression in which the metric is conformally flat. Takes a conformally flat form. So that's what we get. And now, well, the procedure is pretty much the same as what we did in this virtual case, okay? We need to uh, now work out this part in order to get a metric, which is uh, also conformally flat, but the coordinates vary in a range whose cluster is compact, okay? Well, uh, I didn't write here at the beginning the coordinate ranges, but I think that you, uh, well, actually coordinate ranges uh, will depend on each case. So for example, uh, in this case, uh, it's clear that uh, the, the we have uh, different regions. I should have mentioned this uh when starting to discuss this case, uh, because, well, we have to consider the regions defined by the following inequalities. Okay. because the coordinate system which we have only doesn't cover the union of, of these uh, three regions, okay? We, we uh, at R equal to R minus or R equal to R plus coordinates break down. And so uh, we need to consider uh, each of this, this separate, uh, each of these regions separately, okay? So, uh, yeah, but uh, this will uh, come uh, in a minute. When doing uh, these transformations, we don't need to worry about this. We don't need to worry about uh, getting the metric written in such a way that coordinates vary in a 
set with Scratcher is compact, okay? So, uh, yeah, and so we have to do a further transformation here, which is exactly the same as the transformation which we did with Sparsil, okay? And uh, indeed, this transformation uh, are always arises when one works with spherically symmetric uh, space times, okay? It's just, uh, well, I, I just remind you uh, the transformation here, okay? So, uh, this is the transformation, the usual transformation. And well, and after doing this transformation, we just uh, get uh, the following uh, form for the Lorentzian part of the metric. You only have to remember the computations of the case of Schwarzschild to get that. And well, you remember from the previous lecture that now capital T and capital U vary in a set whose closure is compact. Well, just me remember that we did a picture about that set. I'm just going to put to paste the picture now in here. Okay, so this is the picture. Okay, this is the picture which shows the range in which uh, capital T and capital U vary, which is uh, a range uh, determined by these uh, lines. So, so mm, the set in which uh, capital T and capital U vary is this uh, square, okay? Just remember from the lecture about Osvarsul. And now all what we have to do is for each of these uh, regions which we have, okay, we need to identify which part of these uh, regions this uh, boundary set corresponds to, because that will enable us to later uh, draw the Penrose diagram, okay? Well, uh, to do that, we need to bear in mind uh, the values of uh, the coordinate capital R, when one approaches the boundary point, well, we computed those values in previous lecture. This values, those values are written here. And well, just remember that to obtain those values, one has to compute uh, the following limits. I'm just remembering things which we did in previous lecture, okay? so. This is because we have the explicit expression of the function capital R here, okay? So it's just a simple computation to obtain these limits, which we did in the case of a Svartil, and that's the result which is written here, okay? Okay, so this is the, this is common information which uh, we need. And so what we have to do next is to use this information for each of, uh, these regions, okay? Okay, well, again, the well, remember that in Sparsil we just have two regions, now we have three, but the procedure is pretty similar. We have to uh, integrate this relation and then uh, study the qualitative behavior of the function which we are going to obtain from the integral. So let me just take this and let us just all down okay so we have we need to integrate this expression okay 
so we get uh, the r equal to uh, r r squared over uh, minus r squared r minus uh, the r k right so well this is just uh, an integral which we have to do I'm just going to give you the result of the integral the result below so okay so this is the result of the integral which is what well, gives r as a function of we give us big R as a function of uh, small r, okay? Right, now, mm, yeah. Uh, well, uh, let us just, uh, we, we need to find the quadratic behavior of this function. So we're going to draw uh, its graph, which is also simple to do, okay? Uh, big R, small R, and well, we can just place R minus, uh, R plus, and well, I don't think you, I need to uh, explain in detail how to get the graph. We don't need the detailed graph. We actually only know to know uh, the regions in which the function is increasing and the regions in which the function is decreasing okay and well we can just read that easily off from the expression which we have okay here this goes to some value called r not and yeah present expression of r dot is just uh, r naught is r where big r when small r is equal to zero and you get that from uh, express expression which we have well, sorry this is uh, sorry this is r plus minus r minus okay Right, and so uh, when get well, it's a positive one, which I don't need to put absolute value. Okay, it's clear that it's positive since r plus is greater than r minus, right? Right, so, okay, now we have to uh, consider each of the regions which we have, which we, uh, we have to uh, study separately uh, each of the regions okay okay sorry here is a uh, plus not minus right so uh let us take 
r r greater than r plus so in this case we see that uh, just looking at the graph sorry this is what equals to r plus is minus infinite so if we go back to uh, our picture we can uh, identify uh, which part of the boundary corresponds to uh, which region in our original uh, space-time okay just um, well, don't know what maybe I take okay well I think I can just take again this picture and bring it down ah only got part of right never mind I'm just uh, get the picture here and so since uh, r plus uh, since r going to minus infinite corresponds to small r going to r plus it means that in this case we have that uh, r equal to minus infinite corresponds to uh, small r equal to uh, r plus uh, okay, so I can just uh, now delete this and put it this here. And the same happens with this. And just put this here, okay. And then big R going to uh, infinite corresponds to small r going to infinite. So uh, I can replace here big R by small r, okay can replace here big R by small r. I just uh, okay this goes here and okay so uh, in this region we get uh, this picture I can just delete what we don't need okay we oh, sorry, don't need this anymore we don't need this Well, uh, but we do need to bear in mind that, well, in this case, uh, the conformal factor, well, just go back a bit. Uh, rem do you remember yeah, the fi final expression? Well, I forgot to mention that one can define conformal factor in the usual fashion uh, as we always do let's put numerator and don't have okay uh, I hope you the denominator is here okay so we have uh, the usual definition of the conformal factor okay well, just move this just to make a bit more of space right right and so well it's also important to uh, consider for each region the sign of the conformal factor because that will give us uh, the time orientation okay so uh, here uh, in this region uh, we have that uh, the conformal factor is positive 
and therefore uh, the time orientation of this region uh, corris corresponds to uh, the vertical axis and so uh, I'm just going to uh, draw an arrow to indicate that okay that this is the time orientation and so well after doing that you can just get rid of uh, the axis because we only know uh, the picture we only need the picture this picture okay so you can just uh, just put the arrow in the center okay right so this is what we get for uh, the re for this region and then the region uh, r minus less than r less than r plus well now mm, well just look at the graph and we can compute uh, the limits now. We, we have the following uh, result. Uh, this is uh, minus infinite. Then plus infinite okay so yeah again uh, we have to uh, pursue the same procedure well and, and, and all, in, in this case what we get is that uh, the conformal factor if you look at the expression of the conformal factor uh, we get that omega t u is negative okay so yeah well it's just do, doing the same thing all, all again so I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, give you the result I don't think uh, I need to repeat the procedure the explanation again so that's the picture which we have now okay uh yeah and now well this sign gives us a different time orientation okay well let me just uh write this uh, okay this was the previous case and now we have this case okay and and yeah it's just uh it's just the same uh, again just uh, look at look at again at this common picture and realize that in this case uh, r equal to infinite is uh, r small r equal to r plus and big r equal to minus infinite is small r p equal to minus equal to r minus okay right so that's what we have and finally in this uh, case the well, the last region okay well again we uh, have a look at the at the graph and well we have that uh, plus infinite and in this case uh, conformal factor is positive right so yeah uh, in this case we have uh, uh, well we have well in this case well I'm just going to explain this case with a bit more of detail well it's this is similar to one uh, 
of the regions of Svartil, but anyway, just to make sure that everything uh, is understood properly, I'm just going to uh, bring this down. Okay. Ah, again. Okay. Sorry about this. I'm just going to sometimes it's difficult to get all the uh, items in a given graph okay now so we have uh right so uh in this case well we have uh that mm, big r equal to infinite corresponds to uh r equal to r minus okay so i can just put uh, here uh r equal to r minus and same here r equal to r minus right and the the only thing is that uh, uh here we, we have to uh take into account that uh big r never gets to uh minus infinite if we if we look at the graph here okay we see that uh big uh, r uh mm, uh, when r when the small r is positive big r only gets to r not which is uh, po some positive quantity okay so as happened in the uh sparsed case uh we need to uh consider uh the region such that uh r not is uh equal to uh r u right where RTU uh, is what one has in the coordinate uh, transformation okay and well as happened in the spatial case uh, you can see that uh, since we have the explicit expression of uh, RT not well it's actually the same as in the spatial case uh, we have to just uh, find that to, to draw the graph of this uh, of this uh, function in in this picture, and what we get is something like this, okay. And well, as happened in the Svartil case, uh, this region, this graph corresponds to the set of points in which uh, r is equal to zero, small r is equal to zero, okay. Uh, okay, just right here. Okay, so in the end, if uh, uh, and since uh, the conformal factor uh, is positive, now the time orientation uh, goes along the vertical axis. So I can just uh, draw uh, a vertical arrow to denote that. Okay, and so uh yeah so so uh, after all these considerations you can just uh delete what we don't need okay and be left only with the part of the tie of the picture which we are going to use okay Okay, so okay, so we have uh, studied the three uh, different regions. Okay, and so we have obtained three different uh, diagrams, right? Uh, one diagram for small r greater than r plus, uh, or another diagram uh, for this condition and now this uh, last diagram which is for the case in which we have this uh, relation okay so well this is a bit uh, more complex than in the sparsed case in the sparsed case we have uh, two 
uh, diagrams. Here we have three diagrams, and so we have now to find out a way of putting all the diagrams together. Okay, and we have to do that uh, according to the rules which we explained in previous lecture. Let us do that now. Well, sorry, I forgot to mention something. Well, this is similar to what happened when uh, when has uh, in Svartil. Uh, just remember uh, the transformations. Uh, mm, remember that these transformations live in variant the form of the metric which we have found. And well, by doing these transformations, we might obtain uh, additional diagrams. Okay. Well. Uh, well, it's it's. Uh, it's clear what these transformations do to, to each of these diagrams. Uh, well, I just delete the axis, but well, I think that uh, somehow the axis are still in your mind. So, so you, I think you 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 imagine what happens to each of the diagrams when we apply the transformation, and so it means that we need to uh, add additional diagrams. Okay. Well, in this case, for example, t going to minus t uh, doesn't get, doesn't give a new diagram, but this one gives us a new diagram. I'm just going to uh, draw the diagram here. Okay, so take this. It's very simple. So we have to, have to uh, swap uh, uh, some la labels. Okay. And that's what we get. And here, uh, yeah, well, here is by doing uh, the transformation. Uh, to minus u. And here, well. We do the transformation uh, yeah it's the transformation um, going so we get is uh, a new diagram in which now uh, time orientation is a uh, change so I have to draw the arrow pointing in another direction and then it's just uh, moving around some labels okay so yeah and so we get this uh, additional uh, diagram, okay? Well, I maybe I should just for clarity add here. The play, okay? Right, and yeah, and here again. Uh, I just need to uh, um, use uh, well. It's again going to minus u. And then what we get is uh, diagram which looks like this okay I'm just going to okay the time orientation doesn't change but uh, 
the diagram does. Okay, so just do draw the arrow here. Here, this label just to make clear that this goes like this. Okay. So yeah, so that's uh, all uh, the possible independent diagrams which we have. And now it's just a matter of putting uh, all the diagrams together uh, and doing that by following the uh, rules uh, which we explained in previous lecture, okay? Okay, so yeah, let us do that now. Okay. We start with this region. I have to rescale this a bit. Okay. And now we have to add other diagrams along matching sides and keeping the time orientation okay so for example you can take uh, this diagram well uh, you see that here uh we don't have the same time orientation we have to rotate this counterclockwise in order to get uh, a similar uh, time orientation well i'm just going to do that now mm, well and to do that i need to move some labels okay so uh, this goes to this side this goes to this side, this goes to this side, and this goes to this side. Okay. Okay, so we have this, and I have to rotate the arrow too. Now the arrow points in this direction <coughs> sorry all right uh yeah so we have this but uh well it doesn't we don't have much insights here okay so mm, okay so let us just mm, put this diagram aside for a moment because I cannot uh, join this with any of the well sorry we do have much insights we can just uh, uh, do this we can just join on that direction well, I have to uh, but first I have to ah, sorry about this this is a bit complicated sometimes okay I have to uh, rescale first the diagram, okay, and well, we can just join along this direction, but first I need to do a bit of uh, rescaling, okay, okay, now it's more or less uh, okay, right, so. That's what we get. And then, yeah, we need to uh, continue by adding uh, more uh, diagrams. Well, mm,
let us just take this other diagram well here we have uh, well time orientation is already the same and we have also matching sides here let me just put this inside okay so okay so we can just join along uh, this uh, side well, but they have to uh, scale a bit first okay okay some bit more of scaling okay and then well okay so uh, we have uh, now this now let's continue we have just uh, another uh, another diagram which is this one well here we can just join uh, along this side okay because we have a uh, matching time orientations and uh, matching sides okay so we have to scale a bit first a bit more of scaling okay and here it is and then well we can just uh, match with the complementary of this uh, diagram mm. this here you can match along this side again i have to rescale the first a bit Okay. Okay. And well, we can still keep uh, adding diagrams. Well, I'm just going to delete first. Uh, so just keep the time orientation here. And then. here okay and then okay we still have here uh, some more possibilities mm, well for example uh, yeah let us mm, okay this is the easiest way of mm, yeah, for example, this one. Okay, but now, well, uh, we uh, have matching sides, but we don't have matching orient time orientation, so we have to uh, rotate this in order to get a time orientation. We have uh, to rotate this um, counterclockwise. Okay, so this label goes here, this label goes here, this label comes here, and this label comes here, okay. And then, mm, okay. I have to rotate the arrow. I have to so. and well, you 
can just delete this okay and now well we can just take this and match on this side but yeah have to do a bit of scaling to be able to match properly let's do more scaling Okay. Mm. okay so this is what we have uh, so far and well I can delete uh, this uh, part because it doesn't belong to the diagram and now well of, well we can keep adding uh, parts because we, we well in r equal to infinite we cannot add anything else because infinite is not a region of the space time r equal to zero corresponds to a coordinate singularity and so it's not possible to add through a coordinate singular sorry corresponds to a curvature singularity so we cannot add through a curvature singularity but this r plus uh, corresponds to a coordinate singularity so we can uh, take more diagrams here and can keep on adding but uh, well it's just that now uh, the way of achieving that is just by taking this uh, picture and putting it well I'm just going to move it down a bit because I need to okay we can just create another picture similar and just we can just add through uh, this matching part okay and so what we get is uh, a diagram which is what well, we get an infinite diagram here because we can just uh, add also uh, below okay uh, and then yeah we get something which is now infinite actually okay and yeah this is uh, the Penrose diagram of the Reisner Nostrum uh, solution which now is an infinite Penrose diagram well actually we, we well this is the well there are two versions this is the infinite version uh, but we can also get a finite version if we take a uh, the basic building block and do an identification of this part with this part okay I, I cannot do that in two dimensions but uh, you, you have to imagine this in three dimensions and you get something which uh, yeah it's still uh, uh, a Penrose diagram of Reisner Nostrum but it's a different Reisner Nostrum it has a different uh, topology okay I'm just going to uh write this in this fashion okay uh, well in the infinite case okay we have uh it's easy to read off the topology well it's a uh, uh times uh, r times r okay here well it's just uh, okay 
uh, okay but um, I'm just going to uh, discuss uh, the properties of uh, this uh, well, of the space-time corresponding to uh, this Penrose diagram. Well, the idea, well, it's just uh, what, what is behind this uh, procedure is uh, the same as with what we already discussed in previous lecture. We are doing uh, an extension of our original regions into something bigger, which is uh, represented by this uh, complete picture, okay? And, mm, well, we can uh, discuss uh, the features of, of this uh, diagram. Um, well, uh, you can see here, well, this is a bit more complex than the Schwarzschild case. Uh, you can see here that there are now infinite Minkowski-like regions, okay? I'm just going to here highlight uh, one of uh, those regions. Well, are, these are the regions in which R is equal to infinite. And uh, yeah, you see that uh, the diagram here looks pretty much like uh, the Minkowski. So we have an infinite number of asymptotically flat regions, okay? Uh, well, I could use the terminology which uh, one normally uses uh, in Minkowski and call this future null infinity and past null infinity rather than R equal to infinite. So that's what we have here. Okay. And well, I'm just going to use the notation one for this uh, asymptotically flat uh, regions, okay? And then, well, uh, if we just uh, draw a causal curve, which we can do because, well, we, as we know, it's easy to draw in Penrose diagrams causal curves. We see that in, if we have an observer which is start in any of the asymptotically flat regions and it leaves the asymptotically flat regions through R plus, he cannot come back to this, uh, any of the asymptotically flat regions. So uh, R plus will correspond to uh, an event horizon, okay? And yeah, well, you, you see, since this pattern is, is, is repeated itself, uh, this is, uh, this happens if we work in any of the asymptotically uh, flat regions, okay? So, mm. okay, well, I can, I can just add the labels in all the asymptotically flat regions. Okay. Okay, so we have asymptotically flat regions and we have an event horizon uh, which isolates the uh, asymptotically flat regions, okay? Uh, right, but we have something else. We have uh, another horizon uh, because when an observer gets in, uh, leaves any of the asymptotically flat regions, he enters into some different region, but this region doesn't contain any singularity. And in fact, 
there is uh, another horizon here, which separates this intermediate region from the region in which the singularity is present, okay? And this intermediate region is separated by an horizon, which uh, is the region R equal to R minus. And the name of this horizon is the is Cauchy horizon. Okay, and why is this called Cauchy horizon? Well, I'm just going to explain that uh, in a second, but let me just first tidy up uh, this draw a bit first. So we have this. Uh, intermediate region, okay. I'm just deleting stuff which we no longer need. Okay, so this was R plus, R plus, uh, R plus, R plus. Uh, and this is the Cauchy horizon, okay. Minus minus yeah the same R minus R minus uh, this R equal to zero. Okay. Uh, and why I'm calling this uh, Cauchy horizon? Well, the reason is that well this the union of uh, all these four regions gives us a globally hyperbolic uh, subset of because well we can just I'm just going to draw a Cauchy hypersurface here okay you can see from the diagram that uh, sigma is a Cauchy hypersurface But it's a Cauchy hypersurface for the set uh, formed by the union of one, uh, one, two, and two. Okay, because this is set is globally hyperbolic. Uh, the, the whole uh, space-time is not globally hyperbolic, we will see in a minute why, but this subset is globally hyperbolic. And the boundary of a globally hyperbolic uh, set is called Cauchy horizon. Here, this boundary, as we can see in the diagram, is represented by R minus uh, here, up here, and R minus down here. But just remember, that this, uh, the infinite is not a region, so we cannot, uh, it's not a region of the space, of the space-time itself. It's the region of a conformal extension, but not a region of the space-time itself. So we cannot speak of this as a subset of the space-time, but R minus and R, uh, R minus and R plus are regions of the space-time, okay? So, uh, and so, uh, uh, observer which enters uh, the region 2 and uh, leaps through the Cauchy horizon and sees himself in something in the region which we will call region 3 which contains a singularity but unlike in this virtual case singularity is now uh, a space uh, a time like set okay so it means that the observer uh, can avoid the singularity but uh, since the singularity is time-like, it means that mm, information can be created at the singularity, and it can get through. Uh, it can it can get to 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 other sets of uh, of the uh, space-time. Okay. So what this means is that region three uh, is not going to be globally hyperbolic. 
I mean, because uh, we cannot uh, draw a Cauchy hypersurface in this region, okay? So that's why the complete space time is not globally hyperbolic, but we can find subsets which are globally hyperbolic, okay? And yeah, indeed, for example, if we just concentrate uh, in, in any of the regions one, they are globally hyperbolic themselves. So for those regions, the event horizon is a Cauchy horizon too. But what well, we call them event horizon because they uh, isolate the asymptotically, they separate the asymptotically flat uh, region from the other part. So indeed we can speak about a black hole uh, solution because mm, we have an asymptotically flat part, which is like Minkowski, and we have an even horizon, which separates the uh, asymptotically flat part from something else, okay? So this uh, represents still uh, a black hole uh, solution. If we get back to uh, our observer, we can notice an interesting feature. So the observer starts in one of the asymptotically flat regions, enters the intermediate region, enters the region which contains the singularity, and since the singularity is time-like, he can avoid the singularity, he can continue and, well, enter in any intermediate region, which is different from the previous one, and then he ends up in another asymptotically flat uh, space-time. So, he starts, he, by entering the black hole, the observer uh, can exit uh, the black hole, but he, when he exits, he ends up in another universe, in another, well, in another asymptotically flat region, which might represent, for example, another universe, okay? And, well, if we just look at the other diagram, which we obtain by doing the uh, identification, uh, well, uh, the only thing is that, well, uh, you, mm, mm, well, we, we can just, uh, well, in this case, well, this is a uh, region one, this is region one, this is region uh, two, and well, this is, well, let, let us just call the region which contains the singularity, region, well, yeah, I have to turn that, region three, okay, so this is uh, mm, region uh, three, okay. So an observer uh, has, uh, can start at, uh, in region one, enter the black hole. Well, here uh, we are following uh, a different time convention, but it doesn't matter. So uh, then the observer continues through region in which the singularity is. Then he can enters another intermediate region. And then when he comes here, given that the identification, it means that he ends up here. So in this picture, uh, the observer enters the black hole and then leaves the black hole at the same universe in which he entered, but at a different time. So we can think of this uh, representation as a time machine. because uh, there are closed time-like curves here. Uh, and this observer is just an, an example of this, one of these closed time-like curves. Well, I would have to uh, 
join this. And given that we have uh, an identification, then uh, this curve, this uh, timeline curve, is indeed a closed timeline curve. And well, mm, because, well, actually, uh, this curve follows the S1 of the topology. Okay? So, uh, this is indeed a time machine. Mm, we could you know, think of this uh, extension of the raster nostrum black hole as a time machine. Okay? Well, it's not, of course, uh, it's not clear that uh, how to build such a device in reality. Well, uh, this is indeed an illustration of the fact that the metric doesn't determine the topology. Because, well, we have uh, two, well, just, just see here that we have two different uh, diagrams which we, which we obtain from the same metric and they indeed uh, represent space times with different topologies, okay? So uh, that's what we have. Uh, they are completely different. And we have uh, obtained this uh, from the metric by means of a very simple procedure and we didn't have to do any explicit computation because um, all this is, well, as always with Penrose's diagrams, uh, they don't give you a formal proof, but they give you a very valuable information which you can later work out by means of formal proofs. And in fact, it's possible to uh, obtain uh, the explicit uh, extensions that, well, at least uh, in this case, one can work out uh, the extension and obtain a coordinate representation of this space-time. And well, this is not easy, this is highly complicated, this is not straightforward at all, okay? Okay, so this concludes our discussion of, of the, because, well, just remember that we were discussing uh, one case, the Reisner Nostrum solution, uh, the case in which we have two different uh, routes. And now uh, let us uh, discuss the case in which uh, one has uh, two different, uh, when one has one, just one route. Remember, we have this case in which one has uh, one root. And this is the so-called extremal case. Okay. Okay, so let us discuss the extremal case now. Remember the line element of the extremal case? In this case, the coordinates are valid in two separate regions. Okay, so uh, we see that uh, the region which we have before. Uh, Now it's not present, and so what is what due to this fact, what happens in the Penrose diagram is that the diagram which corresponded to this region is gone also. I'm not going to do the full details of the Penrose diagram because the procedure is pretty much the same as in the uh, previous case. I'm just going to indicate the result. You can work out yourself the details as an exercise. And so in this case, 
we have two independent Penrose diagrams due to the fact that we have uh, two separate regions covered by the coordinates. Okay, let me just show you the independent Penrose diagrams. This is one of them. Ah, sorry. Ah, let me just have to put it again. Okay, so this diagram corresponds to the region in which R is greater than M, and well, we can check the the conformal factor, which one gets in the uh, conformal representation is positive. So this is the uh, time orientation, and then. We have another independent Penrose diagram, which is here, right? Okay. And uh, yeah, so it corresponds to the other region. And I have indicated here uh, the location of R equals zero, which is still a uh, curvature singularity. Okay. And so all, all what uh, remains to be done is to match uh, these two Penrose diagrams and put them together in the fashion which we already know. Okay, so this is all very simple. Just give you, essentially, we get a diagram which is similar to the diagram of the non-external case, but with one of the regions missing we will see in a minute. I have to rescale this because otherwise the diagram doesn't fit in the screen. Okay, so this is one part. And then we start matching other parts. Along matching sides as always. Okay, and now we have just to repeat this pattern. Okay, just yeah, I can match on this side. And this is repeated indefinitely. Right? Okay. Okay, well, let me just remark that if we do the transformation to these two uh, diagrams, then we get another couple of diagrams which are reflections along the vertical axis of these two, and then that gives a Penrose diagram which is it's identical to this one, but reflected with respect to the vertical axis. But the properties are the same. Okay. Well, um, I would only like to mention here that uh, we only have we, we no longer have a Cauchy horizon. Okay. Now uh, here, uh, r equal to m corresponds to a even horizon.
well, and well, this is clear from this diagram. If you remember the considerations which we did in the non-extremal case, okay? So uh, we still have a number of uh, regions which represent uh, asymptotically flat ends, and we still have uh, mm, regions in which contain a time-like singularity, which represent a black hole. So this is still a black hole, but uh, no Cauchy horizon as we had before. Okay, and again, uh, singularity can be avoided. An observer gets into the black hole region and then leaves. Uh, can can leave the black hole region and end up in another universe. Okay. Right. Okay. So I think I don't uh, need to give further explanations. And what I would like to mention is that, as happened before, we could get another mm, diagram which presents uh, an extension with different topology. Well, here the topology uh, is. Uh, same as in the non-extremal case. And well, if we just mm, take uh, the two independent diagrams, well, I just can do it here. So this was one of the diagrams. And this is another diagram. And so we can just uh, join in this uh, fashion. Okay. So we get the basic pattern which uh, we had before, but now rather than putting together these two pictures indefinitely, we can just do an identification and then identify this side with this side. Okay. By doing by doing this, what we get is the diagram of another uh, space time which has topology a different topology. Okay, and in this case, well, uh, well again, this is a. Uh, uh, an, an example of the fact that the metric doesn't determine the global topology, and in this case, uh, this this uh, this uh, space time has closed time like curves. This is the same as what we had in the non-extremal case. Okay, so well, just. Uh, Okay, I'm just drawing a close time like curve. This is an observer which gets into the black hole region. And then since this is identified with this, then the observer exits at an universe which is the same universe in which we he started. Okay. So you again can think of this as a time machine. Okay. There isn't much to say about this diagram, which, you have, which we haven't said before. And so let us uh, finish with the discussion of the 
uh, case with no horizons. Well, it was well, well, this, this is the case in which uh, we have this condition. Okay, and let us just define a new parameter. So the metric in terms of this new parameter is written in the form Just remember the three cases which we presented at the beginning of the lecture, right? So, okay, uh, again, uh, the procedure to get the Penrose diagram of this space-time is similar to the other cases. So just take Laurentian part. and do a number of appropriate coordinate transformations. Okay. I'm just going to write the formula. I don't think I need to tell you what I am doing because this was explained before. then always this gets transformed into the usual form. the usual transformation okay so now the thing reduces to studying uh, the relation between to, to integrate in this relation uh, well, you need to just do this integral right and then this gives you the relation between big R and small r.
okay right so well you can just uh, draw a picture of this function always the same story this r is r and well you can see that this is and this function is always increasing and it has no uh, singularities when r is positive so its quality behavior is like this something uh, here which is R not okay R not which is a positive quantity because uh, by construction this is a positive function okay right so it's simple to check that mm, from the graph just for from the graph we get the okay so if we just remember our usual picture which i'm putting here okay then we deduce that uh, r equal to infinite corresponds to small r equal to infinite too so this is the uh, infinite region and big r never gets to R big R never gets to minus infinite as we can see uh, in this graph when R is positive and so again we have to uh, study the set in which R naught is equal to R as a function of T u Okay, and this we have the explicit form uh, of this function. Well, it's always the same. If we one has that by doing when one does this coordinate transformation, it's exactly the same form as uh, one uses in the all other cases. So we again get something. Th this this uh, the graph uh, of this set. Uh, is the blue line which I am going to draw here okay so in this case we only have an independent diagram well of course we can do the usual reflection I'm not going to this, that this doesn't give us a, a diagram which we can use to to join so in this case only an independent Penrose diagram is present and so uh, the Penrose diagram is quite simple actually
Ersten. Okay. Okay, so we have, well, I can actually delete this because it doesn't belong to the region of interest. And so we get something very simple, okay? Okay, and um, well, so, so, so it means that the coordinates which we were using for our metric in this case actually constitute the complete extension. There is no way of, of uh, adding more diagram, uh, adding a copy of this diagram here because this is a curvature singularity and we cannot uh, extend through uh, an infinite region, okay? So, mm, well, the most important feature of, of this diagram is that it contains a night singularity. Why do I say that we have a night singularity? Well, the reason why I'm saying that is that and information coming from the singularity can reach uh, the far region because, well, this is still asymptotically flat because you, you see that uh, this part of the diagram looks pretty much like Minkowski. So we can say that this is uh, asymptotically flat, but now uh, the region which contains the singularity is not separated from the region from the asymptotically flat region by a heaven horizon. There is no heaven horizon here. So it means that uh, if a particle is created at the singularity, then the particle can travel all the way to the infinite region, okay? So that's why I'm saying that it's a next singularity. The singularity can be observed in the far region. An important question is whether night singularities do exist in the uh, nature. And well, it's not the answer is not known. Uh, and actually, well, there is the so-called cosmic censorship, which tells us that a night singularity cannot be developed in a real physical process. Okay, this is a uh, A very rough uh, formulation of this, okay? Okay, so this concludes our discussion of the Penrose diagrams and global, stru global coastal structure of the Reisner Nostrum solution. Thank you for your attention.